Right, today we have come to the lab and we have a look at our time correlated single photon counting setup. Uh, in the setup that we are going to show you today, the uh, light source is a femtosecond pulse titanium sapphire laser whose output varies from 690 nanometer to 1040 nanometer. And then we have something called a pulse picker which cuts down the repetition rate to uh, the desired value. And uh, after that we have second and third harmonic generation uh, arrangements by which we can generate blue and ultraviolet light. This light is used to uh, excite the samples and then the fluorescence of the sample is, goes through a time correlated single photon counting uh, detection uh, detector and electronics and then we generate the decay. So today the purpose is to show you how actually a uh, decay is recorded and uh, wherever possible uh, the components of the instrument itself. So first let us have a look at the laser. This is our femtosecond titanium sapphire laser. Now unfortunately uh, this laser is uh, sort of a black box because you cannot open it and show you what is there inside. Uh, we take a rain check for that and later on in an older model we will show you actually what is there inside a laser. Now the titanium sapphire laser gives us output as I said in the range of 690 nanometer to 1040 nanometer which is basically read almost uh, near IR kind of range. This wavelength is not really useful for uh, excitation if you are going to talk about a fluorescence experiment. Secondly, the repetition rate at which the pulses come out of the laser is about 80 megahertz or 100 megahertz you can think. Which means uh, the separation in time between two pulses is about 12.5 uh, nanosecond. And that is a problem because if you have a long decay which does not get over in 12.5 nanosecond then we cannot really record it. So first of all we have to cut down the repetition rate and then we have to uh, generate what are called higher harmonics about which we will study in detail a little later on. First let me show you what is there inside this box. So what you see here is a lot of optics right and when you see it for the first time everything looks alike. So just to give you an idea of how things work, the light comes in from here, red light and this slab that you see that is the pulse picker. It is a quartz block on which we apply some radio frequency which gives it a uh, variable uh, refractive index and as a result of that we can chop down the number of pulses. So th that depends on what kind of radio frequency we give there. And then the red light comes and is incident on a crystal that is placed there. You might be able to see a little bit of blue light there. That is where second harmonic generation takes place. Second harmonic generation means you can think uh, two photons of smaller energy join up to produce a photon of exactly double the energy. Now this conversion is never complete. Maximum efficiency that you can hope to get is about 20 percent. So uh, out of this crystal we get say 20 percent of light is converted to blue and remaining 80 percent remains red. That comes here and gets split. This is a dichroic beam splitter. So now blue and red lights take a different path and one of these is given a variable time delay using this micrometer screw gauge. Then both of them travel by the same path onto a third crystal which is kept here. That is the third harmonic generation crystal. In third harmonic generation what we do is we mix one photon of fundamental frequency and another of uh, second harmonic and as a result we generate third harmonic which is basically lambda by 3. And now it is time to show you the output. You, you might be able to see two blue spots here. The lower one, the brighter one is actually blue. Right now we are working with a uh, fundamental frequency of 885 nanometer. So the blue spot, this one is half of that, 442 nanometer approximately. And the one, the upper one which looks blue to our eye is actually the UV light, third harmonic, 885 divided by 3 nanometer which is about uh, 290 nanometer or so. Uh, it looks blue because the UV light is incident on the card which has uh, 
uh, a lot of proteins and stuff and they emit in the blue that is the fluorescence we see otherwise it is not visible to our eyes. Now uh, we have to choose which one we want the blue one or the red one right now the red one is being used so the red light goes hits this mirror then comes to this mirror and gets reflected into the uh, sample chamber where we keep the sample. So, we have kept our sample in uh, this cuvette and that goes in here. So, excitation light comes this way, hits the sample, emission is in all directions, but we record in a perpendicular direction. Let me show you the detection channel. The first piece of optics through which the emitted light goes through goes is a polarizer that is kept here. This is a polarizer, you put it in. Here we have a monochromator which we have discussed in the theory class and this is a fast detector that we have. It is a new uh, kind of hybrid detector and you can see the output of the detector goes through this uh, thick cable. Okay, so you see that uh, thick cable, it has come out and it has gone to a small box there. From there, you might be able to see a small cable that comes out and goes into a terminal called start A. That is the start of the uh, time to amplitude converter that we have discussed in the previous class. And uh, before going there, uh, inside that small box itself, we have the constant fraction discriminator. So that is start. What about stop? You can see that there is another terminal there which says stop. Uh, input from stop comes as a synchronous pulse from the laser power supply itself. Right now we are not trying to show it to you because it is a little too circuitous, but we do have a stop which comes from the source. So here you see we are uh, starting charging of attack by the fluorescent signal and we are stopping by the synchronous signal. This is called reverse mode and reverse mode is useful because uh, especially when you do a high frequency kind of measurement, uh, reverse mode helps decrease the dead time of the instrument and recording is fast. Now we will go over to the other side once again and we will actually record a decay. Right. So here we are, uh, this is where uh, we record the decay uh, after the signal comes from TAC to the multi-channel analyzer. A multi-channel analyzer is actually a card nowadays, it goes inside the uh, PC which uh, acquires it. For us, in our case, all the electronics goes into the box that you see right here. So on the screen, you can see two counts, one is stop and one is start. Stop is uh, something like 7956074 uh, and stop is, uh, st start is about 8000 or so. So this gives you the repetition rate of the laser. We are working at a repetition rate of about 8 megahertz. That is the number that you see here, which means that uh, the number of pulses hitting the sample is 8 into 10 to the power 6 per second. And here what we see is number of emission events that are recorded per second. 76527, you can see this number is fluctuating where the number at stop is not. That is because the laser gives out pulses at a constant uh, repetition rate. Whereas when you record the emission, that is a more random event. But we have kept the number of such random events as a very small fraction, 1% or less, no more than 2% definitely of the number of uh, stop events. This is required, otherwise we get what is called a pile up effect and uh, in our decay, we get a spurious fast component. So this is what we get per second. Uh, before acquiring a decay, it is important that we uh, understand what are the parameters. Here you see uh, it says time range is 50 nanosecond. You might remember in the previous uh, session we had discussed TAC range. This is TAC range right here. This means that the TAC waits for 50 nanosecond for another signal to come. It also means that the full scale of our measurement in time is 50 nanosecond. And you see there is something called coaxial delay. Uh, you have to actually delay the start as well as stop pulses appropriately so that they all come in uh, the region where we are looking. 
and now uh, to give you a little better idea uh, th you can uh, look at the start inputs and the stop inputs separately. Uh, here uh, the TCS PC source is custom because we are using a source that is uh, not really part of the spectrometer we are using a titanium sapphire laser. Now this threshold and all generally nowadays for commercial instruments you do not really have to play around with these. But if you are working with an assembled instrument you need to know what kind of threshold uh, you have to set so that you get a good signal and uh, it is not contaminated with too much of noise. These are the start inputs and these are the stop inputs you have seen already uh, coaxial delay of 35 nanosecond and here uh, one more thing that I would like to draw your attention to you uh, to is histogram size here histogram size is 8192 bins which means that uh, in the multi channel analyzer there are 8192 channels. So, if you uh, it is approximately 8000, but the reason why it is uh, 8192 is that you will see in all these measurements it is always 2 to the power something. So, you, you can work out 2 to the power x is equal to 8192 if that is the case then what is x uh, I leave that to you, but these are all, whatever number you get here is always 2 to the power something and that is because uh, computer works on a binary logic. So, this is something that you can change if you change it then uh, the number of points will change keeping the full scale the same. So, that will uh, change your resolution. So, once again let me emphasize that you should not always work with 8000 points. Sometimes you might need more if possible, sometimes uh, it is enough if you work with less. You need to know what kind of decay you are looking at and you have to choose your resolution properly so that you do not end up spending too much of time recording the data but you have data with sufficient resolution. With that background we can try to uh, record a data itself. So, you can see here we have two options IRF and decay. IRF means instrument response function we will record it later maybe before we do the analysis. Right now uh, we are looking at the decay. Let us start acquisition. Uh, here the y axis is logarithmic. So, you can see that uh, the decay starts building right away and to our eyes it looks like all the points are going up at the same time, but that is not correct because if you remember we are recording about 8000 events per second. Our eye does not work that fast, our eye cannot really tell more than uh, 10 or 30 events per second. So, it looks like uh, it is happening all together, but actually it is not. This decay is now being built point by point and what you see here is this is time 0, this here is the decay and it looks like this because it is logarithmic. Uh, the advantage of having a logarithmic y axis is twofold. First of all if it is a single exponential decay it will come up as a straight line. So, if it is anything other than a straight line you know for sure that it is not single exponential. Secondly another advantage of having a log scale is that you can see uh, high counts as well as low counts uh, together. You can see from here to here it is about 10 from here to here is 100, here to here is 1000. So, that is why you can actually uh, look at the smaller decay, smaller count part of the decay as well along with the part where you have larger count. If I do not use a log scale then this is the decay that we actually get y axis now is linear and you can see the decay is practically over by the time we have reached 38 nanosecond which means that the scale that we have used is uh, perhaps good enough. But maybe there was no need to use 8000 points here. So, this is how uh, you record a decay in TCSPC. Next uh, we are going to record the IRF we are not going to show you that and we will show you a little bit about how to do data analysis. Right now we have recorded the decay. Uh, uh, we have recorded up to 5000 counts, but actually it is better if you record up to 10,000 counts at least and uh, we have zoomed in over a range of 15 minus 6 that is 9 nanosecond. So, you can see the decay is almost over there is a little bit more is there beyond it. This is 0 time and uh, these are the points. The next thing to do is to record an instrument response function so that we can analyze the decay that is what we will do right now. Right uh, to record the instrument response function we have replaced the sample by a scatterer in this case uh, Ludox and we have changed the wavelength to the excitation wavelength. The earlier decay that we showed you was recorded at 350 nanometer. Now, we have changed the wavelength to 295 nanometer and we are looking at scattered light and since we are looking at scattered light you can see the counts are really very high and uh, 
even though we have actually decreased the band pass to uh, we should de reduce the band pass a little more it was 4 nanometer now we have decreased to 2 nanometer now we have about 11,000 counts remember in TCSPC you should not have too much of uh, counts uh, coming out of the photomultiplier tube that gives rise to pile up effect and can also affect your detector in the long run. So now we go back and we record the instrument response function. This will be done in a jiffy because first of all counts are so high you can see this blue one coming up that is the instrument response function which means the laser pulse as the instrument sees it. This is uh, the plot with, with y axis in linear scale. This is the plot with the y axis in the log scale. So here you might see that there is a little bit of an after pulse uh, that uh, always comes especially if you use a very fast measurement and if you use ultra fast lasers. But sometimes these after pulses come as a result of poor alignment of the light into the sample chamber and that has to be taken care of by tweaking the mirrors. Right. So now uh, we have uh, recorded the data your uh, decay is here and instrument function is also there and you might remember that we have discussed that in order to fit a decay we have to do what is called iterative reconvolution. We have to uh, decide a fitting model and we have to convolute it with the instrument function that we recorded here and we have to see how good a fit we get. And you might remember another discussion we had how many points we have, how many points do we have in the uh, instrument response function. We had said that the number of points is infinite in principle but finite in practice because we are working at certain resolution. So you see each of these points is going to act as uh, a delta pulse and that is what we are going to use to deconvolute this, da this data and extract the lifetimes. Right. So what you see here is uh, the result of fitting this decay to a bi exponential function. So this range denoted by the two red two blue lines is the range that we have set for the instrument function. So essentially uh, if you remember uh, for getting the intensity or at each of these points in time t we had to integrate the fitting curve multiplied by the instrument function at time t minus t dash over uh, we had written uh, minus, uh, well 0 to infinity or minus infinity to plus infinity. Here for all practical purposes you want to set a limit within which the instrument function has non-zero values and this is the range that we have set. But for fitting the data the range that we have set is much larger from here all the way up to here and uh, we have got the results of the fit here it is something like the first component is 1.299 nanosecond, second component is about 5 nanosecond, uh, shift is a measure of the difference between the peaks of the instrument function and the decay that always happens because of something called color effect in the detector and uh, the amplitudes will show up if you open this up actually they are here from here you can calculate the relative amplitudes of T1 and T2 and chi square turns out to be 1.16472 there is no need to go to so many decimal places 1.16. So uh, if you see a chi square of 1.16 you think it is a good fit more or less good fit but now if you look at weighted residuals. I do not think we discussed weighted residuals in the last class maybe in the next class we will uh, discuss what it is. But if you look at the weighted residuals this give you a measure of uh, how what kind of fitting we have in the entire range of fit. So you see between uh, say 9 nanosecond and 31 nanosecond you have got a good fit. But before 9 nanosecond at short time the fit is really bad which means that we have to play around with this range or change the guess values that we started with and see if we can get a better fit. Now how do you choose a, a range that is to be fitted? So see it is up to 31 nanosecond here we could have gone further. If you went further then practically the data is all zero. So you are fitting zeros that will always be a good fit but that does not and uh, since it is a, a good fit it will make your chi square look better but it makes no sense because uh, what is the point of fitting a flat line? that does not really give you any idea about the time constants that you get as a result of fitting. So it is important that we cover the entire decay we go all the way up to uh, some point where the decay has become 0 but it is also important that we do not go any further. 
And uh, about the other one, range of the instrument response function, it is very important that we cover the entire range where the instrument function may have non-zero values. And to do that, it is usually better to look at it in a semi-log plot so that you don't miss any after pulse that is there. So we'll do the fit once again with a little bit of different range and see whether there is any improvement or not. Right. Now what I have done is first of all I have changed the range. I have increased the uh, range of the instrument response function to make sure that I am not missing out on any uh, point that actually contributes. And I also made this range of the decay a little smaller. I started much later. So you can if you can see I am actually missing out on this much of decay which is not good. Still my fitting is no better than what it was. If you see still the initial part is not fit very nicely which means that perhaps uh, my fitting model is not right. Two exponentials may not be the uh, right function to use. Let me see what happens if I use three exponentials instead keeping the same range. Okay. Now, uh, we have uh, fitted to three exponentials keeping the same range and now you see the residuals are nicely distributed about the mean and chi square is uh, as good as it gets. It has a value of 1.03 but still I am not satisfied with this because you remember we are actually losing out on the initial part. So I'd like to change the range once again and see uh, whether there can be an improvement. Here we go. I have now we are using a triple exponential model and you can see the fitting has started here almost at the top and throughout the decay is quite good. So this, what that tells me is that bi exponential model is not all that good and you have to use a, a triple exponential model which uh, actually makes sense in this case because the sample we are looking at is a protein. The emission uh, of uh, the tryptophan moiety of protein is what we are monitoring here and it is well known that tryptophan even free tryptophan in water or some other solvent always has a triple exponential decay. Time constants we are getting are 1.7 nanosecond, 5.6 nanosecond and it is 2.8 in 10 to the minus 10 which is a very small component which uh, actually may be believable. What we have uh, seen here is that how we fit the data. And while fitting a data, it is not something that gets done by it, itself. Actually it does, but then it is not believable. What you need to do is while fitting data, you have to spend considerable time, uh, work with a model that makes sense. Because you know, if instead of a tri-exponential model, if I use an ex six exponential model or a five exponential model, fit might be even better. Because there is something called over parameterization. While fitting data, if you use a larger number of parameters, the fit is always better, but that may or may not make sense. So we must use a model that makes sense for the system that we use. So the take home message here is that uh, the fitting process might look very, very mechanical, but actually it is not. It has to be done keeping in mind what kind of system uh, we are looking at, what it is that we expect to see. Of course, that expectation might uh, cloud our vision, that danger is always there, but you cannot do it uh, without thinking what kind of a system you are looking at. Right, that is uh, what we wanted to show in this module. We get back to the class after this and uh, we will start a discussion of the different fitting models one can use. We have already talked about single exponential and multi exponential models, but not every decay has to follow one of those rate laws. We will see uh, what are the other situations that can arise while fitting a data. That is it uh, for today.